Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. and I listen to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Indeed you are, people. You listen to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. My name is Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, and I'm back with a CG United Super 50 special show Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Call it whatever you want. But fundamentally, I'm back, people. I'm back to look at the semifinals. The semifinals begin tomorrow. Um, with, in fact, actually, I should probably actually look to see who actually plays tomorrow. So it's TNT versus Barbados uh, tomorrow. That will be November the 16th. And then on Thursday, it will be Jamaica versus Guyana uh, in the other semi final. And I just thought I'd do a little quick video. I always say quick. This one's going no longer than 22 minutes max. Let's see if I can keep to time. So, yeah, just a quick video to kind of preview the semifinals and see where we're basically at with Super 50. If you haven't already done so, I uh, a new piece dropped on the official West Indies Cricket website looking at my top five performers with the ball in this in this tournament. Go and have a read of that particular article. I might put it in the description below. Go and have a read of that particular article to see if you agree with who I consider to be the top five performers. Um, disclaimer, it's not necessarily the top five wicket takers. It's just five people that I think people should have kept an eye on in the tournament um, thus far. As usual, if you're new to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, you can find us on all the social handles. Let me try and be efficient here. You can find us on all the social handles. Look at the ticker tape below. Um, at Carib Cricket, Twitter and Instagram, like, share, subscribe, etc. We're on the road to 4K YouTube subscribers. Also, if you'd like to support the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, you can do so at www.patreon.com forward slash Carib Cricket. And our website is Caribbean Cricket Podcast.com. But let's get into it, people. So we're down to the final four. First things first, I should share the table because there's been there's been a bit of um there's a been there's been a bit of discrepancy and kind of debate about the table for Super 50. Let me just see if I can find the right tab here. Here it is. So you should see this table on your screen now, people. So zone A is clear cut. Okay, so Trinidad topped the group. They played six matches, won four, lost one, uh, and there was a no result in one. So just to remind people who don't know, that one defeat they had was to Guyana early in the tournament. And then there was that ridiculous no result game against um, CCC in which there was a very debatable uh, activity going on from CCC. Guyana came second in the group, uh, won four of their games, lost two. The two matches they lost, they lost one to Trinidad and they lost one to the Windward Islands. And the Windward Islands obviously did not qualify despite starting strong in the competition um, with Athenae's power in two centuries. They did not qualify. Obviously, they got their two wins over the uh, the CCC and one win of Guyana, but they faltered near the end of the tournament and did not make it through. In zone B, now ESPN have it wrong, which is why I've brought this screen up. Jamaica topped the group, 16 points. Clearly, they won four, lost two. Those two defeats, one defeat came surprisingly to the West Indies Academy, their only win of the tournament, and the other defeat came um, early on to the Leeward Islands but courtesy of double wins over Barbados and then one win each against Leeward Islands and uh, the academy they got through. And then you'll see the big debate. So if the groupings had been done on net run rate, the Leeward Islands would have qualified for the semi-final. And you can clearly see, if I scroll up, you can clearly see that the Leeward Islands net run rate compared to Barbados was um, superior and much superior to Barbados. However, Upon inspecting the competition rules and after a lot of confusion, fundamentally what it boiled down to was that Barbados had a better head-to-head -head record versus the Leeward Islands. And it's all because the earlier game between Barbados and Leeward Islands got washed out. So they ended with similar records. 1-3, lost to one washout and no result, which was against each other. Now, when Barbados then played Leeward Islands um, two days ago, Barbados beat them, chasing down, I think it was, let me just double check my figures, uh, Barbados chased down 
271. Um, their target was 268, sorry. And they chased it down in 47 overs, ending on 271 for five, which fundamentally got Barbados into the semi final. The reason I think this is even more of a debate is because, well, I'm about to get into it, but arguably the Barbados squad, if I had to compare the two squads and the overall performances, don't shoot the messenger, but I think the Leeward Islands were a better, better team in the competition than Barbados was. And I just, I don't know, the head-to-head, -head, head-to-head being the deciding factor doesn't sit well with me. I'm not sure why it wasn't net run rate. I guess I should try and ask the question, but ultimately Leeward Islands finished second on net run rate, but they finished third based on their head-to-head -head record because Barbados beat them in the one game that was completed between the two of them. Whether that was fair or not, that's what's happened. And consequently, um, Barbados are in the semifinals and not the Leeward Islands. So let's get into it then. As I said, the first game is Trinidad versus Barbados. And what I want to do is just kind of look at the four sides that have made it through. Let's start with Barbados. Uh, the four sides that have made it through to Super 50. So Despite Barbados winning three games in the group stages, so just to clarify again for people, that means they won two games against West Indies Academy and won one game against the Leeward Islands, and they made it through based off that. And this is why I'm debating how strong... I don't know. No, let's just call it this. They won the two games against West Indies Academy and they um, uh, beat the Leeward Islands, and that's enough to get them through. I... I mean, once you're in the final four, you're in the final four. We saw in CPL that once Jamaica got got to where they got to, they managed to find a way to win in the clutch and then go and win the, the whole tournament. So I'm not saying this to say Barbados Pride cannot win Super 50. All they have to do is put two good games together. But I just think there's so many weakness. There's so many questions about this side that I just don't know if they've got the game to put it together. So just to clarify for people, with the bat, remember Boston Chase has gone to go has gone to Australia. So with the bat, Shea Hope, the captain, has led from the front. 287 runs, at an average of 57, a strike rate of 93, I should point out, which is much better than his, obviously, international strike rate, as it should be. He's led from the front with the bat. But when you look through the rest of the Barbados squad, Others haven't really shown up. Some might say Shamar Springer, but he's got one score of 41 and a couple are not out. So I can't even include Springer. Chase was good early on in the tournament, but he left after three matches. Once you get past Hope, this is the figures you've got. You've got Zachary McCaskey. Um, he's batted five innings, 198 runs, an average of 39, which, uh, sorry, technically an average of 40 if you round up. So that's good. And maybe I'm wrong to say no one else has shown up, but his strike rate is 69. And my argument is once you get to a semi-final now, I'm not sure if those strike rates are going to be what you need to come good in the clutch. Kyle Hope, who's been called in um, because of people like Chase leaving uh, the tournament early, Kyle uh, and Craig Braffaite, Kyle Hope in his three matches so far, 107 runs at an average of 36. But his strike rate is 61. So again, similar problem. And then after that, you don't have anyone showing up with the bat. No one else. Jonathan Carter, the experienced, the experienced batter, has only got 22 runs in the tournament and at an average of four, right? Russian Primus, um, he's batted three innings, average of 24. Nicholas Curtin, he's batted five innings, an average of 23. The other batters haven't shown up. And I just don't know if going into a knockout game, it's good enough to just have Hope McCas the two Hope brothers, sorry, or the Hope brothers rather, and McCaskey. Some of the other batters will have to show up for Barbados. They surely cannot just rely on their bowling attack to try and find a way through um, in a semi-final game and then a potential final game. Now, what Barbados have done, remember Barbados have been based in Antigua for the tournament. Barbados have got to a point in the tournament where they're not even playing fast bowlers anymore. It's just Akeem Jordan who bowls his like six, seven or eight overs. And then it's just spinners. And this is why I think there's criticisms to be had about Super 50. How can we be in a tournament where a team is playing one seamer? Some of you are going to say, what about Jonathan Carter? But one frontline seamer and then a bag of spinners. 
Now, again, on the flip side, you can say, well, hold, it doesn't matter, Mash. Barbados have made it through to the semi final, so the strategy works. And just for clarity, I should say this is the um, contribution of the, the Barbadian spinners. Roston Chase, three matches, seven wickets at 16. Kamari Boyce, four matches, four wickets at 21. Jamel Warrican, six matches, six wickets at 39. Uh, Nicholas Curtin, one week, six matches, one wicket at 122. Javed Leacock, four matches, seven wickets at 25. Um, so the spinners, they've been going to their spinners as the tournament has gone on. And then essentially the Barbados pace attack, Ramon Simmons hasn't featured since the early tournament. So the Barbados pace attack is essentially Akeem Jordan, Jonathan Carter, and Russian Primus. Now, Akeem Jordan's got one wicket in the tournament. Carter took a fifer against, I think, at the academy. So he's got six wickets at 15, admittedly. And Russian's got five wickets at 32. I mean, I'll put it to those watching and those of you who are Barbadian fans. I'm just not convinced by this side. I'm not saying they can't win the tournament. I'm saying I'm not convinced. And I am surprised that a side lacking the quality. Because remember, in fairness, that again, to the, the Barbadian team, lots of their players are in Australia. Mayers, Holder. Brathwaite, Chase, uh, Raymond Reefer, if he was going to play for them, Kimar Roach, if he was going to play for them, Lot, uh, Shamar Brooks, lots of the Barbadian side are in Australia. So you could say on the flip side, they've done amazingly well to make it to the semis, given how weakened they are. I don't think they've got enough to go through the clutch uh, to get through a semi versus Trinidad and then the final versus Jamaica or Guyana. But you just never know. Again, those in the comments, get at me. Um, do you think I'm being harsh there? Do you think they've got more in the tank with their batters and their bowlers? Do you think they can come good in the clutch? So that's that's the Barbadian team. And then when we go to look at, uh, let's look at Trinidad. So Trinidad topped their group 18 points. And, and I should say that, that Trinidad have been exactly what they we thought they would be, even though they've lost Josh De Silva, who's gone to Australia. Um, who else did they lose? They've lost Jaden Seals, gone to Australia. But the squad they've got is still very strong. But that does not guarantee that Trinidad and Tobago will defend the title they won in 2021. But what's been, I think, impressive for Trinidad since their early loss to Guyana early in the group stages uh, okay, that that washout versus CCC, but they have been very dominant in all of their matches since. If I go back through the games, um, so Trinidad's last game, they beat Wimmer Island's Volcanoes by seven wickets, okay, uh, chasing down 2-4-9 um, for only the loss of three wickets. They beat Guyana by six wickets with 93 balls remaining, getting to 1-8-3 in 34 overs. They beat, C well, no, that CCC game was washed out. I won't even count the CCC games. They beat Wimmer Islands in the other game by seven wickets with 42 balls remaining. So as the tournament has gone on since after that early loss to Guyana, Trinidad have got stronger and stronger and stronger, as they should do given their squad. And if you look at their batters, everyone has shown up in some shape or form pretty much. Nicholas Puran is currently averaging 223 in the tournament, 250s, highest score of 99 not out, which was in the last game. Kion, a uh, strike rate of 119. Kion Otley opening has been very good at the top of the order. Remember, he went on that Bangladesh tour when everyone pulled out. Kion Otley is averaging 66 um, at the top of the order with a strike rate of 80, 150. Darren Bravo is averaging 57. His strike rate is only 75, which is poor given he's an international player. But again, he's got 250s. Josh De Silva has gone, but he was averaging 33. Yannick Carrara is batting down the order, but he's averaging 30. He's only had one at bat. He's only had one at bat. And the thing is, because Yannick Carrara is now being invented as a leg spinner first and foremost, people are forgetting that the guy can actually bat. But he's only had one at bat. He's got average of 30. Jason Mohammed, given his experience, is poor. He's only averaging 28. Um, but uh, Jai Gooley, who's come into the side, he's had... He's played four matches, but again, he's only had one at bat because he hasn't had to bat. He got a 58 when he had a chance to bat. Sinil Narayan has only had one at bat and he made uh, 30 runs with that one at bat. So again, 
<laughs> Akil Hussain's only had one at bat, such has been the strength of the TNT side that some people ain't even really faced many balls in the in the competition, despite them having six group games. So again, that kind of shows you that Trinidad have 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 been strong. Now, again, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll come to the semis and smash uh, Barbados because, again, it's all about who shows up in the clutch. But based on paper and based on how both teams respectively have been in the, the group stages, Trinidad should be the side that wins that semi final. And again, even if you look with the ball, um, everyone in the Trinidad bowling attack has shown up, whether it be pacers or whether it be um, spinners. Sinal on the Ryan, six wickets at an average of 23, economy 2.87. Jason Mohammed, two wickets, an average of 22, economy 3.66. Yannick Karaya, 10 wickets at 21, economy 3.96. Akil Hussain, nine wickets at 29, economy 4.4. Even Terence Hines, five wickets at 24, economy 4.7. Shannon Gabriel, 10 wickets at 16, economy 4.9. Imran Khan, he's only played one match, four wickets at 13, economy five. Everyone in that Trinidad batting and bowling lineup has done something at some point in the tournament. But ultimately, like we say, it's all about are they going to show up in the clutch? Barbados could well surprise them. All depends on who shows up in that, who shows up in the clutch. But on paper, Trinidad and Tobago should be overwhelming favourites, but that might not mean anything. And it's worth pointing out one thing. Trinidad and Guyana are now coming over from Trinidad to Antigua for the semi-finals and potential final. So in fairness, Jamaica and Barbados technically have the advantage having played all of their group stages in Antigua. Will it take Trinidad and uh, Guyana a long time to a quote unquote acclimatize to now having to switch up the way they're playing. Spin has been far more effective in Antigua in the tournament based on numbers than it has necessarily been um in Trinidad. So so well no maybe that's wrong actually. That might actually be wrong. I need to double check that. But spin has been very effective in the Antigua leg of the tournament. So are Trinidad better geared up um to take advantage of that than Barbados? We shall see. I said this was going to be 22 minutes. 18 minutes have gone. I haven't even looked at the second semi-final. And then very quickly, people, if I just look at Jamaica versus Guyana, the, the Caribbean Cricket Podcast derby. My side, Jamaica, got the better of Guyana in the eliminator in CPO. Will they do Will they do the double and get the better of Guyana, um, the Harpy Eagles, in the, semi uh, in the semi-finals for Super 50? So just looking at Guyana, uh, if I look at Guyana first, again, Right, rightfully end in second in the group. They they beat Trinidad once. They beat Wimmer Islands once. Um, actually, did they beat Wimmer? Yeah, they beat Wimmer Islands once. They beat Trinidad once. Um, and who was the other team in that group? And they beat um the CCC twice. I don't think anybody really counts those games versus CCC. They were so one sided that them being in the tournament was almost an irrelevance. But um, Guyana. So, what to make of the Guyana squad? I mean, the big story with the Guyana squad is, despite them having a plethora of talent, and I'm looking primarily at Shafane Rutherford and Shimron Hetmeyer, neither one of them has shown up. Now, this I say that to say that that could be the best thing possible for Guyana, because surely Shafane Rutherford and Shimron Hetmeyer, and to an extent, and, and Leon Johnson, are they really going to go through the whole tournament doing nothing? Just for those who don't know, Shafane Rutherford's numbers Six innings, 128 runs, an average of 21, no 50s. Shimron Hetmeyer, five innings, 90 runs, an average of 18. Strike rate only 84, by the way. Leon Johnson, six innings, 83 runs, an average of 14. He's at least got 150 in there, but then that shows you how bad the other five innings must have been. That's three of their top six flopping time after time after time after time. Will they suddenly find form in the semis? My point is this. If they do, Guyana will probably beat Jamaica. But if they carry on stinking up the tournament with the bat, then Guyana will have it. Will have a hard time of it to beat Jamaica because they're going to basically have to turn to their bowlers and say, bowl us to victory, irrespective of what we can do with the bat. The, the players within the Guyana side that have turned up with the bat, Tevin Imlak, uh, in his six innings, 
248 runs. Remember, Santolki did that interview with him, which is on our CCP channel. Six innings, 248 runs, average of 50. Strike rate's only 65, but given how little anybody else has contributed in the Guyana side, he, they probably need him playing that anchor role, and he's got 250s in the tournament, okay? Um, uh, Savary has come in late. Savory, I should say. He struck a 50 late on in the tournament. I don't know if he'll play in the semi. Uh, Gudakesh Moti is actually done well down at night, number 9, 10, and 11. Um, it's got an average of 49 at the moment because he's had three not outs. Romario Shepard has biffed it a lot down the order, 250s, average of 36 um, in his five innings, highest score of 74 not out. Tej has obviously gone to Australia. Anthony Bramble has won 50, but again, he's only averaging 25. So the point being, the guy in these batting lineup has flattered to deceive. And again, they can thank their lucky stars that they basically had, I mean, so did Trinidad and so did Wimbledon Islands, but they can all thank their lucky stars that the group wasn't balanced in Group B. Like the win, the West Indies Academy were more competitive than CCC were in, uh, in sorry, was it Group B? Have I said the wrong group? Um uh, sorry, Group A or Zone A. CCC were a waste of waste of time. So I don't know how competitive this Guyanese batting lineup really is because they've not shown up in the shown up enough in the tournament for me to gauge where they're truly at. What I do know is that their bowlers have been good. Gudakesh Moti, eleven wickets at twenty. Uh, Romario Shepard, ten wickets at twenty. So their bowling in general particularly those two who have led from the front, have kept them in the competition. Um, Pestano, five wickets of 33, but that's nothing really to write home about. Kevin Sinclair, five wickets of 40, that's nothing to write home about either. Nell Smith has played only one game, three wickets of seven. So Moti and Shepard have left, led the way. Is there enough in that Guyana squad to defeat the Scorpions? Yes. Has that Guyana Harp Eagle squad shown up on a regular basis where you can say 100%, mm, yeah, they're the favourites against Scorpions. No. No, I don't think they have. Um, but if they do show up and the 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 quality of the batters they've got, then yes, I would say Guyana Harp equal, equals Eagles, sorry, Eagles, Eagles are slight favourites, but obviously their form is patchy. And then just lastly, people, just looking at Jamaica, Again, Jamaica topped their group. Um, four wins, four wins in their group. A shock loss to West Indies Academy, but fair play to Jamaica Scorpions. And I don't just say this as a Jamaican, but if you if you lose one game in that group, the only game that West Indies Academy won, and you still top the group, that shows you how dominant they were against Barbados, who they beat twice, and obviously they beat the Leeward Islands once as well. Again, that's probably added to Rothman Powell's resume as a leader and as a captain. Remember, he's a CPL winning captain this year, and now he's taken the Scorpions to um, the semifinals of Super 50. In terms of... Sorry, people, got a drink of water, you know. In terms of the Scorpions, given they're playing Guyana, I don't know, is it... Uh, there's some similar points to make with regards to the Scorpions and Guyana. I think that the Scorpions... Like, Guyana have lost Shandapur. That's it. The Scorpions have lost to Australia, the Australia Tour, and Kruma Bonner and Jermaine Blackwood. So arguably, the Jamaica side is weakened more so than the, the, the Amazon Warriors side. Amazon Warriors. The Harpy Eagles side, which is why I have to give Jamaica credit for making their way through. Basically, their, international play, their, their remaining international players have led from the front particularly with the bat, Rothman Powell, six matches or six innings, um, 216 runs at an average of 54, strike rate of 124, 150 in there, obviously two not out. So Rothman has led from the front, um, as he should do as an international player. Brandon King, who's been opening for the whole tournament, six innings, 261 runs, an average of 44. Strike rate's only 77, but again, being an international player, him and Rothman have led from the front. The, the issue I've got for Jamaica is this, and certainly against Guyana uh, and what somebody like a multi might do to them. If Rothman and Brandon King don't fire, 
I do not believe that Jamaica have got enough in their locker to defeat Guyana. There is a lot of responsibility on Rovman and Brandon to stick in and set an innings up for Jamaica. To put this in perspective, Rovman Powell, sorry, so Brandon King is 261 runs in the tournament. Rovman Powell is 216. The next highest after that is Andre McCarthy with 109. That's a 100 that's a 107 run difference between the second highest run score on the side and the third highest run score. And that Andre McCarthy, Andre McCarthy's 109 runs have only come at 18. Strike rate is 60. Chadwick Walton, 79 runs uh, at 26. Strike rate is 60. No one else's. Aldane Thomas, 38 runs, average of 13. Alwyn Williams, 31 runs, average of 10. I am, boy, if if I, if I was Guyana, the game plan is clear. Get Powell and King out, win the game. That's really what it boils down to. I do not know if watch Chadwick, uh, Aldane, Alwyn, Andre McCarthy, Oldine Smith. I don't know if you can look at them and say, boy, can you do a little ting in, in the semi-final, much lesser final with the bat. However, where Jamaica have been strong is with the ball. There has been a lot of... Co- so whereas when I looked at the Guyana bowling attack, obviously Ramira Shepard and Goodikesh Malti have done their thing. But Jamaica's bowling attack has seen more people contribute. So when I look at Jamaica versus Guyana, for me, it's all about whichever side's batting lineup shows up, wins the game. I think... Wait, is that what I want to say? It's not about whichever side bowls better. Because I, th- mm-hmm. I don't know if that's the point I'm trying to make. Let me talk, tell you about the, to the Jamaican bowlers to, to make you understand why I'm saying this. Sheldon Cottrell has come into the tournament late. He's only bowled eight overs. So he's bowled about four or five overs. Sorry, three, four or five overs for the two matches. He will sh- certainly play in the semifinal. But clearly they're kind of nursing him back from injury. In the, in the eight overs he's bowled so far in the tournament, he's bowled two wickets at an average of five. Economy of 1.25. He's the ace in the pack. Will Is he fit enough to now bowl a 10-over spell if needed in the semi-final? Javar Royal, nine wicket left arm spinner, nine wickets at 23. Pete Salmon, six wickets at 15. Uh, Jamie Merchant, six wickets at 25. Dennis Bullay, 12 wickets at 14. Oldine Smith, eight wickets at 24. Nicholson Gordon, 10 wickets at 21, right? When you look at the Jamaica bowling lineup, they have far more Arsenal in their um, in their lineup than Guyana do. And when I mean, some Guyanese might, fans might say, "Oh, but we got this, we got that." But the Jamaican bowlers have turned up game after game after game. It's almost as if they know, well, boy, our batting ain't really saying too much. We've only got Brandon and Rodman firing, so we got a sharp as bowlers. I have no doubt that the Jamaicans can out-bowl Guyana. Um, however, the Guyanese batting lineup has more quality in it. So that I think that's why I'm saying whichever batting lineup shows up will probably win the game. That's re- really and truly. Um, that, 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 that's how I see it. Both have flattered to deceive at times. So which, whichever one shows up, if either one of them posts a good total bat in first, game's probably over, is is what I would say. Um, I think that's I think that's how I would see that match going between Jamaica and Guyana. So despite me saying this was going to be 22 minutes, we're 29 minutes deep. So I guess I better give my predictions. Um, TNT versus Barbados. I think TNT will win that. Um, Jamaica versus Guyana. I think Guyana will win that. Obviously, I want Jamaica to win, but I suspect Guyana will win that. And I think if I had to bet right now, I think I'm we're looking at a TNT versus Guyana final. Obviously, as a Jamaican, I want the Scorpions to beat Guyana. But if I had to look at it on paper, I just don't see Rutherford, Hetmeyer and Johnson all flopping again. But you just never know. But anyways, 
let me put my let me put my cards out there. I'm saying TNT versus Guyana in the final. But by all means, people, as usual, get in the comments below. Like, share, subscribe. Let me know what you think. If the, if this is the first time you're listening to the the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, um, do do subscribe to the channel. Um, and do let people know who pos- potentially want to know stuff about West Indies cricket, but have never really found a channel that goes in depth like we do, people. But um, as ever, stay locked into our channels, Twitter, Instagram, look at our articles, which are on the official West Indies uh, cricket website. Uh, go listen to episode 76 of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. That was an in-depth conversation with Dominic Warren, the commercial and marketing director at Cricket West Indies. Go listen to that latest episode. And of course, follow West Indies on 99.94 DM as well. But for today, people, that's been uh, the latest kind of CG United Super 50 episode. Thank you and good night. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans.